Hola amigos. Recently I was working on an effect for a small project and I thought that it could be a fun one to share in a tutorial since it is not very complicated. This effect is quite configurable and it's not very expensive. You could use it as part of a scene transition or some kind of edge of reality wall or even as part of some player ability to shift reality or some filter like that. As you can see, you can also exclude objects from the effect which can have a few cool uses for gameplay features. I'm starting with a very basic empty level. Most of this is going to happen inside a post-process material, so the first thing that we need is a post-process volume to apply the material to. After adding it to the scene, I will set it to unbound, so we don't have to worry about the size and position of this volume. And now we can create a new material, give it a name and dive right into it. The first thing we need to do is set the material domain to post-process and optionally set the blend location to before tone mapping to have the rest of the post-process stack to be applied to this one as well. Once we have set up the basic properties we can start adding some nodes. Ok, so we want this effect to be a wall that moves along the x-axis and everything on the other side will be rendered as a flat texture. We can simply take the X component of the world position and saturate it to clamp the value between 0 and 1. You can think of this value as a mask, where points before X equals 1 have a value of 0 and points past that line have a value of 1. Technically, there's a tiny gradient going from 0 to 1 unit, but it is too small to be visible. And just for now, let's add a scene texture using the post-processing zero channel and a linear interpolate to combine it with a flat color, using the mask that we just made as the alpha. We cannot combine different size vectors in a LERP, but we can use a component mask to get rid of the fourth channel and the compiler error at the same time. Once everything is connected, we can go back to the scene and fit this material into the post-process volume from earlier. If everything is working correctly, you should have something like this, where the scene is divided into two zones, one rendered as a flat color. Next, we are going to work a bit on the transition between these two areas, starting by adjusting the size of the gradient between them. We'll do that by dividing the x-coordinate before the saturate by a scalar parameter, which I called transition width. This value is measured in world units, so I did set it to 300 for this example. After saving the material, we can go back to the scene and verify that the effect now changes gradually from x equals 0 to x equals 300 before it is fully opaque. Next, let's replace this color for something more interesting. I just downloaded a simple space tiling texture for this example, but anything will do here. Since the sample texture node gives us a four-dimensional RGBA output that we can use, we don't need the component mask on the scene texture node and we can get rid of it. Let's take another look at it now. Oh, this is so much better but the transition is still a bit boring. Let's spice it up next using some 3D noise. I'll add a comment box around these nodes so I can keep things more or less organized. And now we could use a 2D texture here, but Unreal has a decent 3D noise that we can use to make sure that it propagates nicely in all orientations without having to remap it. Make sure that you select the Fast Gradient 3D Texture function on the Noise node. To control the scale of this effect, we can add a divide between the world position and the noise nodes using another scalar parameter. I'm also changing the minimum output of the noise from minus 1 to 0 because we want the full range without the negative values. Next, a saturate node, just in case there are some rogue values produced by the noise that are higher than 1. And to apply this noise, 
we can use a step function between it and the value that we are using as our mask and replace its connection on the linear interpolate. This step function will return the noise only for those points in which the value of the noise is higher than the value of the mask. And since the mask is only less than 1 on the transition area, that is where the noise is applied, giving us this cool broken edge look. I think that this noise has a nice organic feel to it that looks great for an effect like this, but you can experiment with other types of noises or use any other gradient texture to achieve completely different results. We could play a bit with the parameters to change the scale of the noise or the size of the transition. But next, I want to highlight the edge with a different color to catch the eye. The easiest way to do this would be to repeat the same that we did for the mask, but adding a small offset to the noise value to make it bigger, and then getting the difference between both. After grouping those nodes with another comment box, start with an add node and another scalar parameter. This one will set the width of this edge effect. Then another saturate, followed by a step against the mask, just like we did before. And now we just have to subtract this offset noise from the original one to get the edge, and then multiply it by the color that we want it to be. If you set the location earlier to before tone mapping on the material parameters and you have enabled bloom on the post-process volume, setting this color to high values will make the edge glow on the camera. Once we have all of these nodes connected, we can blend this back into the main image with another add node. This time, we will have to convert one of these vectors to match the number of components of the other. You can do that using either an append node with a constant zero on the color edge or a component mask set to RGB on the main image. Since we are not really using the alpha channel, either way is fine. After that, we can save and apply and check it on the same viewport. Looking good! The cool thing about using a 3D noise, which I mentioned earlier, is that it projects nicely on any surface without having to worry about the texture stretching at certain angles. Next, I want to add some animation to the noise. We'll make the whole effect move later on, but I think that having that extra secondary detail motion adds a nice touch to it. We can achieve this by adding the time to the warp position that we are feeding into the noise. To control the direction and speed, I'm using a vector parameter, but you can get interesting effects with other values. For example, try making the noise pan away from the camera or towards the pixel normal. I will make the whole wall move in the x-axis for this example, so I will set the noise to pan in the same direction, save and apply, and we can take a look at the updated effect. Awesome, the noise is moving, but the effect is still in place. We could just add another parameter to this material, but since I was using the position of the wall for other gameplay purposes, I decided to set it in a separate parameter collection, which is easier to control without having to get and set the active instance of the material. This is quite straightforward, but not everyone is familiar with it. In a content browser, create a material parameter collection in the materials category. These are basically variables that we can easily access in runtime from either blueprints or materials. Give it a name and jump right in. For this example, we only need to add one scalar parameter, which will be the X offset for the effect wall. Once that is done, we can go back to the material and fetch that value. Add a collection parameter node and select the file and variable that we just made. In my case, it is the post-process global collection and the end of the world offset parameter. To apply this value as an offset, we can add or subtract it from the X position coordinate. I was using subtraction, but only because the negative value made more sense for my specific use case. Once that is done, we need a way to update the parameter in runtime, and we will do that using a new empty blueprint. 
this new blueprint will be super simple. It only needs one float variable which will control the movement speed of the effect wall and a couple of node operations to update that offset value. In the event tick, first we will multiply the delta time by the speed. This will scale it so we can be conveniently specified in world units per second and will also make it independent of the engine's frame rate. Then add a get scalar parameter value and set it again to the same collection and parameter name. We are going to take this value, add the scale speed to it, and then set it back again using a set scalar parameter value with the same setup as before. After dragging this blueprint from the Countdown browser to create an instance in the level, the wall should move away after hitting play. Perfect, we're almost done here. Finally, you might want to exclude certain objects from being consumed by this effect. To do that, we can use the stencil buffer. I will set this sphere to use the custom depth pass and set the stencil value on it to 1. Now, we can go back to the material and add another scene texture, this one using the custom stencil ID. If I take this and output for a moment, you can see that now the sphere is rendered as a solid white mask. This means that we can simply use this in a new linear interpolation between the original scene texture and the filter one and output the result. I'll finish setting this lerp and change the speed of the effect on the blueprint to make it move faster and in the opposite direction. If things are correct, the sphere should stay in place after everything else is gone. And with this, we can call this tutorial done and done. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving a like and subscribing to the channel. See you next time!